The Last Leaf by O. Henry, recorded for Love Stories, Volume 1, by William Jones, Bonita Springs, Florida. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Leaf In a little district west of Washington Square, the streets have run crazy and broken themselves into small strips called places. These places make strange angles and curves. One street crosses itself a time or two. An artist once discovered a valuable possibility in this street. Suppose a collector with a bill for paints, paper, and canvas should, in traversing this route, suddenly meet himself coming back, without a cent having been paid on account. So, to quaint old Greenwich Village, the art people soon came prowling, hunting for north windows and eighteenth-century gables and Dutch attics and low rents. Then they imported some pewter mugs and a chafing dish or two from Sixth Avenue and became a colony. At the top of a squatty, three-story brick, Sue and Johnsy had their studio. Johnsy was familiar for Joanna. One was from Maine, the other from California. They had met at the table d'hote of an Eighth Street Delmonico's and found their tastes in art, chicory salad, and bishop's leaves so congenial that the joint studio resulted. This was in May. In November, a cold, unseen stranger, whom the doctors called pneumonia, stalked about the colony, touching one here and there with his icy fingers. Over on the east side, this ravager strode boldly, smiting his victims by scores, and his feet trod slowly through the maze of the narrow and moss-grown places. Mr. Pneumonia was not what you would call a chivalric old gentleman, a mite of a little old woman with blood thinned by California zephyrs, was hardly fair game for the red-fisted, short-breathed old duffer. But John Z, he smoked, and she lay, scarcely moving, on her painted iron bedstead, looking through the small Dutch window panes at the blank side of the next brick house. One morning the busy doctor invited Sue into the hallway with a shaggy gray eyebrow. She has one chance in, let's say ten, he said, as he shook down the mercury in his clinical thermometer, and that chance is for her to want to live. This way people have of lining up on the side of the undertaker makes the entire pharmacopoeia look silly. Your little lady has made up her mind that she's not going to get well. Has she anything on her mind? She... She wanted to paint the Bay of Naples some day, said Sue. Paint? Bosh! Has she anything on her mind worth thinking about twice? A man, for instance? A man, said Sue, with a Jew's harp twang in her voice, is a man worth... But no, doctor, there is nothing of the kind. Well, it is the weakness, then, said the doctor. I will do all that science, so far as it may filter through my efforts, can accomplish. But whenever my patient begins to count the carriages in her funeral procession, I subtract fifty per cent from the curative power of medicines. If you will get her to ask one question about the new winter styles and cloak sleeves, I will promise you a one in five chance for her, instead of one in ten. After the doctor had gone, Sue went into the workroom and cried a Japanese napkin to a pulp. Then she swaggered into Johnsy's room with her drawing board, whistling a ragtime. Johnsy lay, scarcely making a ripple under the bedclothes, with her face toward the window. Sue stopped whistling, thinking she was asleep. She arranged her board and began a pen and ink drawing to illustrate a magazine story. Young artists must pave their way to art by drawing pictures for magazine stories that young authors write to pave their way to literature. As Sue was sketching a pair of elegant horseshoe riding trousers and a monocle on the figure of the hero, 
an Idaho cowboy, she heard a low sound several times repeated. She went quickly to the bedside. Johnsy's eyes were wide open. She was looking out the window and counting, counting backward. Twelve, she said, and a little later, eleven. And then ten, and nine, and then eight, and seven, almost together. Sue looked solicitously out the window. What was there to count? There was only a bare, dreary yard to be seen, and the blank side of the brick house twenty feet away. An old, old ivy vine, gnarled and decayed at the roots, climbed halfway up the brick wall. The cold breath of autumn had stricken its leaves from the vine until its skeleton branches clung almost bare to the crumbling bricks. "'What is it, dear?' asked Sue. Six, said Johnsy, in almost a whisper. "'They're falling faster now. Three days ago there were almost a hundred. It made my head ache to count them. But now it's easy. There goes another one. There are only five left now. Five what, dear? Tell your Susie. Leaves on the ivy vine. When the last one falls, I must go too. I've known that for three days. Didn't the doctor tell you? Oh, I never heard of such nonsense, complained Sue with magnificent scorn. What have old ivy leaves to do with you getting well? And you used to love that vine so, you naughty girl. Don't be a goosey. Why, the doctor told me this morning that your chances for getting well real soon were. Let's see exactly what he said. He said the chances were ten to one. Why, that's almost as good as a chance as we have in New York when we ride on the streetcars or walk past a new building. Try to take some broth now, and let Susie go back to her drawing so she can sell the editor man with it, and buy port wine for her sick child, and pork chops for her greedy self. You needn't get any more wine, said Jonesy, keeping her eyes fixed out the window. There goes another. No, I don't want any broth. That leaves just four. I want to see the last one fall before it gets dark. Then I'll go too. Jonesy, dear, said Sue, bending over her, will you promise me to keep your eyes closed? and not look out the window until I'm done working? I must hand those drawings in by tomorrow. I need the light, or I would draw the shade down. Couldn't you draw in another room? asked Johnsy coldly. I'd rather be here by you, said Sue. Besides, I don't want you to keep looking at those silly ivy leaves. Tell me as soon as you're finished, said Johnsy closing her eyes and lying white and still as a fallen statue, because I want to see the last one fall. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of thinking. I want to turn loose my hold on everything and go sailing down, down, just like one of those poor, tired leaves. Try to sleep, said Sue. I must call Behrman up to be my model for the old hermit miner. I'll not be gone a minute. Don't try to move till I get back. Old Behrman was a painter who lived on the ground floor beneath them. He was past sixty and had a Michelangelo's Moses beard curling down from the head of a satyr along the body of an imp. Behrman was a failure in art. Forty years he had wielded the brush without getting near enough to touch the hem of his mistress's robe. He had been always about to paint a masterpiece, but had never yet begun it. For several years he had painted nothing except now and then a daub in the line of commerce or advertising. He had earned a little by serving as a model to those young artists in the colony who could not pay the price of a professional. He drank gin to excess and talked of his coming masterpiece. 
For the rest he was a fierce little old man who scoffed terribly at softness in any one, and who regarded himself as a special mastiff-in-waiting to protect the two young artists in the studio above. Sue found Berriman smelling strongly of juniper berries in his dimly lighted den below. In one corner was a blank canvas on an easel that had been waiting there for twenty-five years to receive the first line of the masterpiece. She told him of Johnsy's fancy, and how she feared she would, indeed, light and fragile as a leaf herself, float away when her slight hold on the world grew weaker. Old Behrman, with his red eyes plainly streaming, shouted his contempt and derision for such idiotic imagings. Thus, he cried, is there people in the world with their foolishness to die because leaves they drop off from a confounded vine? I have not heard of such a thing. No, I will not bose as a model for your fool hermit, Dunderhead. Why do you allow that silly pisaness to come in the plain of her? Ach, that poor little Miss Johnsy! She is very ill and weak, said Sue, and the fever has left her mind morbid and full of strange fancies. Very well, Mr. Behrman, if you do not care to pose for me, you needn't. But I think you are a horrid, old, old flibberty gibbet. You are just like a woman, yelled Behrman, who said I will not pose. Go on, I come meet you. For half an hour I have been trying to say that I am ready to pose. God, this is not any place in which one so good as Miss Jonesy shall lie sick. Some day I will paint a masterpiece, and we shall all go away. God, yes. While Jonesy was sleeping, when they went upstairs, Sue pulled the shade down to the window sill and motioned Behrman into the other room. In there they peered out the window fearfully at the ivy vine. Then they looked at each other for a moment without speaking. A persistent cold rain was falling, mingled with snow. Behrman, in his old blue shirt, took his seat as the hermit miner on an upturned kettle for a rock. When Sue woke from an hour's sleep the next morning, she found Johnsy with dull, wide-open eyes staring at the drawn green shade. "'Pull it up. I want to see,' she ordered in a whisper. Wearily Sue obeyed. But lo! After the beating rain and fierce gusts of wind that had endured through the livelong night, there yet stood out against the brick wall one ivy leaf. It was the last leaf on the vine, still dark green near its stem, but with its serrated edges tinted with the yellow of dissolution and decay. It hung bravely from a branch some twenty feet above the ground. "'It is the last one,' said Johnsy. "'I thought it would surely fall during the night. I heard the wind. It will fall to-day, and I shall die at the same time.' "'Dear, dear,' said Sue, leaning her worn face to the pillow. "'Think of me, if you won't think of yourself. What would I do?' But Johnsy did not answer. The lonesomest thing in all the world is a soul when it is making ready to go on its mysterious far journey. The fancy seemed to possess her more strongly, as one by one the ties that bound her to friendship and earth were loosed. The day wore away, and even through the twilight they could see the lone ivy leaf clinging to its stem against the wall. And then, with the coming of the night, the north wind was again loosed, while the rain still beat against the windows and pattered down from the low Dutch eaves. When it was light enough, Johnsy, the merciless, commanded that the shade be raised. The ivy leaf was still there. Johnsy lay for a long time, looking at it. Then she called to Sue, who was stirring her chicken broth over the gas stove. "'I've been a bad girl, Susie,' said Johnsy. "'Something has made that last leaf stay there to show me how wicked I was. 
It is a sin to want to die. You may bring me a little broth now, and some milk, with a little port in it, and, no, bring me a hand mirror first, and then pack some pillows about me, and I will sit up and watch you cook. An hour later she said, Susie, some day I hope to paint the Bay of Naples. The doctor came in the afternoon, and Sue had an excuse to go into the hallway as he left. Even chances, said the doctor, taking Sue's thin, shaking hand in his, with good nursing you'll win. And now I must see another case I have downstairs. Behrman, his name is, some kind of artist, I believe. Pneumonia, too. He is an old, weak man, and the attack is acute. There is no hope for him. But he goes to the hospital today to be made more comfortable. The next day the doctor said to Sue, She's out of danger now. You've won. Nutrition and care now, that's all. And that afternoon Sue came to the bed where Johnsy lay, contentedly knitting a very blue and very useless woolen shoulder scarf, and put one arm around her pillow and all. I have something to tell you, white mouse, she said. Mr. Behrman died of pneumonia today in the hospital. He was ill only two days. The janitor found him on the morning of the first day in his room downstairs, helpless with pain. His shoes and clothing were wet through in icy cold. They couldn't imagine where he had been on such a dreadful night. And then they found a lantern, still lighted, and a ladder that had been dragged from its place, and some scattered brushes and a palette with green and yellow colors mixed on it, and look out the window, dear, at the last ivy leaf on the wall. Didn't you wonder why it never fluttered or moved when the wind blew? Ah, darling, it's Behrman's masterpiece. He painted it there the night the last leaf fell. End of The Last Leaf by O. Henry